from the culture of the American South, where roots hold stories, comes a natural deodorant inspired by generations of wisdom. Introducing Root Work, the all-natural foundational Black American-based deodorant infused with the magic of High John the Conqueror root. Our unique blend enriched with this legendary root offers 24-hour protection rooted in the power of nature. Embrace this deodorant that celebrates culture, history, and your well-being. Unlock the magic of root work today. Experience the pure essence of nature. Visit rootworkstyle.com and make the switch to a healthier cultural choice. Be in here. Let's get the fam in here. Let me get my volume together. Y'all good? Hope everybody is good, ladies and gentlemen. We are here and we are live doing our thing. Glad to have everybody tapping in on this lovely Monday evening. And I'm early. I'm we're relatively early. Usually I go on like around 10-ish or something like that. So I'm a little early tonight more than usual, but glad to have everybody tuning in. Uh, we're going to get some calls in a minute. What's up, Sir Major? Shout Everybody shout out to Brother Sir Major. Shout out to Sir Major. Sir Major, I saw a tweet where you said the the, the DoorDash driver ate your food. <laughs> man, y'all got to watch these, these DoorDashers and all these people, man. You got to watch them. Um, yeah, you never know what goes down with these folks. But um, a few things we're going to touch on. Let everybody pile in the room. Let's get the room nice and chunky, and then we'll chop up some game about some things. Um, first of all, we got four days left for the microphone check crowdfunding. Um, remember, it's an all or nothing program. We got to get the full thing or it's nothing at all. And we have to get to... A buck eighty, one hundred and eighty k. We're right now at one hundred and thirty two k. So we got like forty something k to go. So family, if you can um go to microphonecheck.com and let's hit that goal, that would be phenomenal. What's up, nice to girl? I see you, dear. Um, yeah, if you guys can go to microphonecheck.com and be a part of this historic project, that would be phenomenal. That would be absolutely great because this is historic and groundbreaking what we're doing. And it's much needed because we have to start countering so much stuff that happens to us. When we do things as black people, particularly foundational black Americans, there's always going to be some kind of sabotage. There's going to be some kind of monkey wrench thrown in the game. And we should not be um, in positions where we ignore that. We got to be very active and proactive um, with countering a lot of the things that the anti-black racists like to throw at us. I got to give a shout out to Chicago because our brothers and sisters in Chicago, they're really pushing back on what's going on out there with the resources being given to some of those, well, well, too many of those migrant groups. The black community in Chicago, they're really standing up strong and they're standing on business. And I take my hat off to them, brothers and sisters, and we stand with you. And we got to keep that energy all over the country. When it comes to our resources, we shouldn't be ashamed to say we need our resources to help people within our community first. Nobody's being unsympathetic towards all these other groups, but hold your own nuts. We are taxpayers. We work hard. We grind hard. Our, we get taxed up and down, and we want to have our tax dollars benefit the people who need it right here. And there's nothing wrong with that. Let's please stop letting these people shame us into wanting to look out for ourselves. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And the good brothers and sisters in Chicago, they're really, really stomping hard saying to the politicians there, hey, we we don't want you giving our money away. Shout out to um, Black Alpha and um, I think it was Black Alpha and um, 
Marcel Dixon, they hollered at one of those politicians out there. Was it in Georgia or South Carolina? It was one of the politicians. They got on his bumper about using all of these minority terms and all of that stuff. So, you know, we got to we got to keep that heat on these folks, man. We got to keep the fire up under them and let them know, you know, we're just not going to take a lot of the stuff laying down. White supremacy don't take no breaks. Black empowerment should not take any breaks either. We got to see how this thing goes all across the board. Everything we do, whenever we start making progress, we better understand that there's going to be pushback. Um, we see what's going on with Colorado and our brother Dion, Dion Sanders in Colorado. Did y'all see when they were playing the game against UCLA, somebody was allowed, and the key word is allowed, to go into their locker room and steal um, jewelry, wallets, money, credit cards. They were allowed to go in there and steal stuff. That was to kind of demolish their morale. Um, that was something from the top. That was something from the top. And, and from what I understand, the security guards and don't nobody know nothing. Nobody knows what happened. There's no way they don't have security around those facilities. There is no way, especially in high profile games like that. Everything is high profile with Colorado. Now we got the media all over the place. Um, you know, they got security all over the place and somebody could just go into their locker rooms and take this jury willy nilly and wallets and all of that stuff. That's something coming from the top family. That's something coming from the top. That's one of those situations where a whole bunch of folks are on code and they're involved. They've been trying to sabotage our brother Dion from top to bottom. They're trying to sabotage that brother, sabotage the team. Y'all y'all saw that dirty-ass call they put on him, on his um, son. I talked about that last night. They said the son was targeting, then they ejected him from the game. So they, they're doing all types of little dirty plays on and off the field. And we got to understand how the white supremacists work. Anything, anything, anything justifies a win for them. The white supremacists are desperate. They need wins, and Deion Sanders going over there to Colorado and dominating college sports, they couldn't let that happen. That's too much of an L for them. They're not going to let a, a black man and his black sons come into a, a, a league and just dominate it without pushback. You know, there's going to be some pushback now. All types of little behind-the-scenes grimy stuff. They've been doing little grimy stuff against Dion. Um, ever since he got there, um, all of these other coaches and teams, they're, they're assisting his opponents. They're chiming in on how to beat him. Yeah, they know how to get on code with each other. Don't get it twisted. They know how to get on code with each other at the drop of a hat. They put all their differences aside and majorly get on code with each other. And we have to get on code with each other as well and counter the deceptive things that they do. Okay? So I digress as far as that. Um, but we do have a lot of people in here, and I'm going to get some calls in a minute. Did y'all see this? What's this beef thing going on with um, academics? And uh, <laughs> academics is beefing with everybody now. Him and Glorilla, the rapper Glorilla, they're going back and forth. And they're dissing each other, and it's real weird. She's calling him fat and pudgy, and he's calling her Sid from Ice Age. So they're going back and forth. And then the dude, Saucy Santana, got mixed up in it. I don't know how his name got in it. So they start, academics was dissing Glorilla, and then he started dissing Saucy Santana, talking about you got a beard and a BBL. I don't know how it then Saucy Santana then made a video threatening academics and the threats got real weird. I don't know. I know it's some real ratchet nonsense, but it's it's on my Twitter timeline. That's why I'm speaking on it. I usually don't pay attention to some of that lowbrow stuff. I, I really don't pay attention to lowbrow ratchetness. But Saucy Santana said something that kind of, you know, put me on alert. 
he he told academics, he said, yeah, we'll meet up and fight. Let's meet up in the streets. I'll beat your ass and then fuck you in the ass. I was like, uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, this is a different kind of gangsterism going on out here in these streets. Hold on. Hold on. What kind of thugging are y'all doing now? Saucy Santana said, I'm going to F him in the ass. Whoa. I'm a, I'm a little, I'm a mature gentleman. Let me say that. I'm a very mature gentleman. I'm not in the streets like that no more. I used to be back in the day. It's been a long time. Has it been that long? I'm I, I, I'm out of touch with the streets now, guys. I don't know what's going on out here. This is what y'all doing? My youngins? This is how y'all are, are, are getting down in the streets? Damn. You're doing bussy beatdowns? That's, that's what y'all doing out here now, youngins, my young people? Where are my young people? Where are my... Um, where my 15 to 25s? <clears throat> Raise your hand in here. Let me talk to y'all. Let me talk to the youngins real quick. I have to talk to the children for a minute because I don't feel safe no more. As an elder, I'm an elder now because I'm, I don't know what's going on. I'm, I feel like an elder. As an elder, am I safe in these streets around the youngins? Because if y'all doing that type of stuff, I'm good. If y'all doing that, if that's if that's the new gangster, because this dude Saucy said it with his chest, I'm like damn brother, that's why I don't fight them. I don't fight them punks. That's one thing. I, I show them punks the respect they need to get. I will not fight one of them punks. The more them punks can fight, and also the stakes are high if you lose. I don't want to lose because if you lose, you know, no telling what they're going to do. If you unconscious, I am not trying to scrap one of these dudes and then get jumped from behind by another one. And I wake up somewhere in a hotel room next to Andrew Gillum. Well, hell, what happened? And why am I oily? You know, I don't want that to happen. I don't, I don't mess with these dudes. If I see one of them on some gangster shit, hell, nigga, take my wallet. Take my wallet and go do as you wish. Yeah. I can get credit cards back. You can't get your bussy stretched back where it's supposed to be. <laughs> that's that's something that don't you don't get that back. So yeah, I don't I don't want to lose that. Yeah, I don't want to lose that. You go, you fuck around with these punks and and lose your boy genity. <laughs> yeah, you gonna lose your boy genity out here messing around with these dudes and get a good old fashioned buck breaking. So I'm cool. I ain't losing my boy genity out here for these niggas. Anyway, uh, speaking of moisture, I, I put up a clip of you, Roland Martin. Y'all see Roland Martin. It was a Bell Biv DeVoe concert. And they had, you know, Bell Biv DeVoe, they bring people on stage to dance on the song Poison. They usually bring women. And there was a bunch of women up there. And then they had Roland. Roland got his ass up there. The stage full of women and Roland got up there. In a big ass Lane Bryant Kente cloth. And or they put the music on and Roland started dropping his ass to the ground. And, you know, you know how Roland do. I said, man, who is this? Bell Bib Buffet. And I think Roland got on his Finster account complaining of some of the Roland fans. Some of the Roland fans got on there hating. Oh, y'all niggas just hating. Tyreek, you just mad. You ain't got knees like Roland. Like, what kind of flex is that? <laughs> Are you trying to say I'm jealous because I can't twerk like Roland? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I proudly can't twerk. You're right. I don't have knees like Roland, nor do do I want them. I don't want to drop it low. I don't want to throw ass in a circle. The hell? People think everybody ain't trying to do more shit with y'all. No. 
I'm not trying to drop down and get my eagle on. Yo, know, Lord. The the flexing y'all have out here. You just mad because you can't drop it like rolling. <laughs> that is not a flex. But I digress. I digress. Let me get some calls in here because we've got a lot of people in here. Let's get um Daro Santiago. What's up, Daro? Um, hello. Um, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, so just inquiring minds want to know um how do you know what bussy means? Um, because bussy is first of all the funniest word in the English language, and that's what a lot of you punks use. Y'all use it, and it's funny. It's a funny word. No disrespect. Why? I'm just curious, and also, how do you know what punks mean, and how does you, you're saying you're saying it in the right way? So I'm just very right. curious. Right, because I know how people speak, and I know different slangs, and I know certain things about the way people describe themselves. And there are punks who describe themselves as punks. There's punks who are good people. So what are you what are you inquiring about? What what's your um what are you in, in um what are you kind of making an accusatory statement about? What are you suggesting, sir? I'm not suggesting anything, but thank you. Okay, because you, you you're very accusatory, Daro. I'm not accusing you of anything. Oh, okay. No, you just I've just never heard a straight man just say bussy and punks in just such the the right way. So right. you know, thank you, thank you for that. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right, thank you, Daro. Well, the punks always want somebody to be moist with them. No. <laughs> Boy, the punk, the punks, they want to project their moisture. They want, they always want to project. They don't, don't try to project. Yeah, I know the words. Because yeah, I, I hear y'all say them. That's how I know. I got ears. I hear people say them. And the bussy is hands down the funniest word on earth. I think the, a lot of punks don't like that we, we use the word bussy because that was supposed to be their little secret word for each other. <laughs> you know, and now we kind of make a mockery of the word. That's, it's literally the funniest word in the English language to me. That That word is hilarious. That word is absolutely hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um yeah, why wouldn't we know certain terms? Because everywhere we go, you guys are and what white mommy and white daddy, they're pushing stuff like that down our damn ears and eyes everywhere we go, they're pushing rainbow stuff at us. It's all over the place. You can't go anywhere without rainbow stuff being pushed at you. What do you mean? How wouldn't we know what some of this stuff means? I mean, you can't go anywhere. You can't go to Starbucks without rainbow propaganda. You can't buy candy for kids without rainbow propaganda. You understand? It's everywhere. And that's the reality. Yeah. It's literally all over the place. But I digress. Let's get um let's get um tis this that. This that hop on this that. What's up, this that? How are you, brother? Uh, I'm blessed. Uh from from Detroit. First off, I'm I wanna know how how your uh how your nephew doing? But nephew's pulling through. He's pulling through, and um, um, we they're, they're letting us know to kind of lay low on the information because it's an open case. And, okay, say no more. But yeah, but he's, no good. he's good. I, I'll say he's good. I'll say he's good. Yeah. Okay. So, secondly, I have a couple other questions. Um, something, I saw a picture of him down. Somebody had a picture of their profile of Christopher Dorner down there. And I always wonder, why didn't anyone, whether it was his family, was his family threatened? Why did, didn't the DOJ or anybody investigate further? What, or did they, and we just don't know about it, behind what was going on with Christopher Dorner <laughs> and the precinct he worked for? Um, I don't know what that was, you know, I don't know what the, the backstory with his family is, but with Chris Dorner, his whole thing was he was on the police force, he saw them abusing people, he reported it, and then they reprimanded him 
for reporting abuse. So he's like, hey, damn that. And he just saw how corrupt the LAPD was. And he said, hey, man, I, I got to take this thing to another level. So he, you know, he he turned <laughs> up on it. So that's basically the long and short of it. So I don't know what kind of correspondence they have with his family or anything like that. So, you know, I don't know. But, you know, he, um, he was really against the corruption within the department. He saw that it was corrupt from top to bottom. Yeah. Let's get day zero in. Hey, what's going on, Tariq? What's up with the family? Um, I'm, I'm good, the Dave. Funniest, Thank you. The, the funniest word that, that I think is Boochie Cat, that for me oh, yeah. is funny. <laughs> that, that round, that Boochie Cat, that joint is crazy. <laughs> but, man, man, um, man, man. But I but I wanted to uh I'm you know I like to get in and get out real quick with with my um with my words here, but you you touch on a lot of subjects and I really respect your research and, I, and I've learned to love it over uh, over the last couple of years your research. But you know in Chicago right they were taking the the park from the uh, the locals um, and they were using the community centers and. Uh, for the kids that were playing baseball and basketball. I remember seeing it on the news and everything like that. But I remember the community members had just popped up in the community because they never really talked to the eldermen of the community, and they already have these plans already in place. But you want to know what, though? They showed a, um, a picture of the camp that they were showing up, that they were going to be building up, and it looked eerily familiar with this UN camps that they have down in, uh, you know, the Darien in the Darien Gap where they have all those camps down there <clears throat> and they got all these NGOs that are really helping the migrants, you know, cross through the Darien Gap. They have camps and they have camps in every one of the countries that kind of bring them up and they give them out maps, kits and all that stuff like that. I had posted it into the, um, into the uh, post of, of the, uh, yeah. the live just to kind of go through it. But I want you to, um, you know, you know, Kind of I'm gonna look into that. I'm looking at also now in Chicago. What was that? I saw something with some Palestinians yeah. getting to it with the black Israelites. What happened with that? Oh, I didn't. See, I didn't see that. I didn't. Okay. I, I mean that that sound that sound comical. No, but I don't. Yeah. I didn't see. That. I got to find out what's going on with that. But thank you so much, brother. Um, yeah, my Chicago people. Let me know what's going on with that. I saw some of the Hebrew Israelite brothers getting into it with some Palestinians. They were out there throwing hands. And I don't know what triggered it, what set it off. I don't know what it was about. But yeah, they were getting at each other. So I'd like to know what happened with that. Let's get um, William in here. Let's get William. Let's get William. All right, William. Pace, Pace, you can hear me? Yes, sir. What's up, Will? Peace to the God, peace. Um, First and foremost, uh, I want to say I'm glad to hear that your nephew's good. Um, Thank you. That's it's amazing. It's amazing. I'm glad to hear that. Yes, sir. Uh, that's some serious yeah. shit right there. Real uh, talk. Too, <laughs> speaking of uh, Bussy, your man, <laughs> I said, y'all, I never in my life would have thought I'd seen Roland Martin Bussy popping on stage. <laughs> your, man, <laughs> your man saw that comment, said, y'all enjoy being dumbasses, and then blocked me. <laughs> oh, he, oh he, he, saw the, he saw the clip I put <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I did because uh, he has me rolling has had me blocked for years. Yeah, so. yo, he's 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 a corn boy. He ain't about no knowledge of self. He ain't about pushing black people forward. But speaking of that, that whole bussy popping thing, I saw something today on Twitter about Sesame Street, something about diversity or inclusion or something like that. And I said, Okay, I sense a trick bag coming. So I commented and I was like, It sounds like some LBGT shit about to be pushed in. Yeah. Um, so they was like, Y'all don't see nothing that's wrong with that. I said, It looks like grooming. We got yeah. Sesame Street is a show for kids. So everybody's arguing with me about, oh, you just, uh, y'all straight black men this, y'all straight black men that. We the only one protecting the kids. Right, right. You, you know what I mean? Everybody, like, so it, it's funny. Like, the, the word Bucci, uh, Bucci, <laughs> Bussy is hilarious. But yeah. on a serious note, yeah, we the only ones protecting the kids from this bullshit. No um, talk. Hey, let, me, let me land your plane on that and touch you on that. Yeah, you know, there's there's always this thing where they have to attack black society uh, with the homophobia label. They always run to us, pointing the finger at us, trying to shame us for speaking out against grooming, because that's what that's really about. 
when we start saying, hey, man, why don't y'all leave these kids alone? Oh, y'all, the homophobia in the black community. You see, they're the ones who make the correlation between LGBT and pedophilia. They make that correlation. We don't give a damn what grown people do. But when it comes to messing with kids, that's something that we all say as foundational black Americans openly. That's not it right there. And I've always said this many times. Foundation of Black American culture, we're the only group of people who don't have an open pedophile culture, meaning you can't go anywhere in Black society where somebody will direct you on where to get kids. You know? Now, do we have pedophiles within our society? Yeah, we do. We do. But it's behind closed doors and don't nobody know about them until they get locked up. You understand that we don't, we don't let pedophiles just walk among us and be like, hey, you go on over there if you want to get down. No, 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 no. Now, they get handled within FBA society, especially when they, even when they get locked up, they get handled. And in other groups, you can go to some of these other countries and they have little, um, little rings and little subcultures where they'll, you know, they, they direct people to go to that if they want that. You know, they got it in Africa, in Asia, India, um, the Caribbean. You know, that's why the, the Epsteins and those guys, they go set up shops and they set up shop in the Caribbean or they set up shop in parts of Africa. They'll set up shop in the Philippines somewhere, you know. But yeah, we don't get down like that. We're the only group that don't have an open um, society like that, where that is allowed openly. Let's get label it in. Label, hop on, man. What's up, Tyree? I'm good, man. How are you? Oh, man, I'm good, man. What's up, man? Who you is, man? Where you, where your people from? Okay. Now, you know good and well that, you know, we're foundational black Americans, sir. Nah, nah. Where your people from, though? Um, North Carolina. Because last time, hold on, hold on. Hold on. We, we, the reason why I'm asking that is because last time I was on your stage, you was questioning me about where my people was from. Right, I told you where they from. Now nah, I want to know where your people from. You know what I mean? I don't remember talking. When did I talk to you? Oh, it was just a couple of days ago. It wasn't that long ago, man. Come on, you got amnesia, my nigga. Like, come on, can we stop? <laughs> I swear to God, I don't remember you. But yeah, you know where my people are from. I'm in Alabama, North Carolina. Now, where all right, so the what? Run me, nah, nah, run me, run me down four lines. Run me down four lines. Run me down four lines, Tyreek. Like, run me down four lines. You on the spot right now. I mean, you know, let's go. Run me down four lines. Lenny is based. Let's go. Well, I just told you. Now, where's your family from? What part of the Caribbean? Oh, see, that's what I'm saying, Tyreek. Come on now. We deflecting, my nigga. Like, come on now. Fuck with me. I'm fucking with you. Like, fuck with me. Where your people from, though, my nigga? Like, where they from? Uh, brother, what part of the Mama, daddy, grandpa, grandpa. I mean, come on, let's go. Like, what, what, what we talking about? What part of the Caribbean are you from, bro? Oh, hey, yo, come on, sorry with this bullshit, bro. Lord, <laughs> this man. Yeah. Hey, Tyree, come on. I'm trolling. I'm trolling tonight. I'm trolling tonight. I, I'm big trolling tonight. Let's go. No. Yeah. I mean, what we talking about? The, <laughs> and again, this is Caribbean trolling. And what part of the Caribbean? Are you from? Uh, hey. All right, bro. bro come on, bro. I am. And I know you're trolling, and it's not witty. That's why I know you're from the Caribbean somewhere. The tethers are not witty at all. Yeah, dude. You know, trolling is supposed to be funny. If you know, it is supposed to be wit to it. If you're gonna do that, it's supposed to be witty. But not witty. A lot of a lot of a, a lot of tether comedy or wit. It goes over with white people because usually it falls in line with a little coonin. For example, who's this guy, Kai Sinat? No disrespect to the kid. He's a little Haitian boy, right? He's a little Haitian kid. And he has a, um, he's on, what, what platform is he on? Was he on Twitch or something like that? He was, he was on one of them platforms. He's on one of them platforms. And he has a big following on there. And mostly white people. Most of the following is white people. And, you know, a lot of black people are like, how you, how you get all them followers? 
um, a lot of black people look at the stuff as just really not witty. It's not witty. It's not funny to us. So right now he's doing like a a little live stream kind of skit where he's in a prison. They're in a prison and they're doing like, you know, they in a prison for seven days and they're doing these little skits in the prison and family. I, it's, none of this shit is funny to me. I am. Am I out of, I'm thinking, am I out of touch? It's, the stuff they're doing is just not really funny. I'm not even hating. I like if you do a skit, make it witty. Like Drewski, the Drewski guy, he does a lot of skits. Now, Drewski is funny. Some of his skits are funny. Some of his stuff is very witty. I can get down with it. Country Wayne, some of, some, sometimes it's corny, but some, some of it is funny sometimes. You think? Um, there's some people who do skits that are hit or miss. Sometimes it's funny, but some of these guys, this stuff where they're doing in the prison, it's it's just not funny. I'm, I'm I just don't see the wit or the humor in it. Yeah. And again, a lot of their humor and wit appeals to um, the dominant society because they kind of indulge in a lot of stereotypes. Well, just the fact that the dude, Kai Sinat, is doing a stream in prison, you know, that's kind of stereotypical there. So I guess he's playing on stereotypes, and that's something that white people like to see. They like to see us in prison. You know, that's some shit they like to see. You know, but there has to be a wit to it. If you're going to do some prison skits, it better be witty. What's um, Ha Ha Davis? He's done some jail skits. They were funny. You know, he gets right to the point and it's funny. This, this, these dudes being in prison for seven days and it is, they're just doing real goofy stuff. And it's, I, I don't see the humor in it. I don't see the humor in it. Let me get Sir Major. Sir Major, who is this Kai Sinat guy? What, what's this guy's deal? I know you probably are familiar with some of his stuff. But what's Sir up, Sir? How you feeling? I'm good. How you doing, bro? Good, 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 man. Uh, a couple things really quickly. Uh, did you so obviously you saw Rolanda Martin? Uh, I call uh, her Rolanda Martina. Did you yeah. see how he was snapping his neck and kicking his feet out like you know, like the strippers kick their feet out? Yeah, <laughs> Lord. Like the for the money. <laughs> man, he was like, damn, he was and popping he said, it like Cardi B. Man. <laughs> Lord. He couldn't. He couldn't wait to start twerking on that stage. <laughs> oh God, boy! They put him on that stage. He was like, "Oh, I'm about to show out." <laughs> boy, that was he. He thought he was. It was the Renaissance tour. He was Beyonce. Like, damn, you know? Yeah, Man. he was live in the concert. He was live in the concert. But um, Man. the other thing that I wanted to uh, ask you about was, you know, that this, this thought culture that that is being celebrated by the Jewish folks in radio. So when you look at who runs the labels and who owns the, the stations, you know, they promote this degenerate music, Sexy Reds, Sukihanas, and City Girls. But the, that's, all, that's all admissible, and that's all permitted. But the moment you mention that community, the Jewish community, all hell breaks loose. So why is it that, you know, they're allowed to depict us in such a manner, but if you ever say that the Jewish community owns and dominates X markets, then you're somehow anti-Semitic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Well, the thing is that with me, man, I like to, I, I put white supremacists all in one group. I don't like to break them up because when you break up suspected white supremacists and different ethnic groups and religious groups, you know, that gives them an alley-oop to me. Then they'll start pointing the finger at each other. If you break them up in political groups and all of that, they love that. So I don't break them up like that. Because you got record execs like Tommy Mottola. He's not Jewish, but he was, you know, Michael Jackson was calling him out. You had a whole bunch of other execs, you know, Anglo from whatever background. And they all on cold with each other. Let's be very clear. They're all on cold with each other. You know, um, the, um, all those execs all across the board in America were against Michael Jackson. When Michael Jackson got that catalog, all of them were against Michael Jackson. They all got on code against Michael Jackson from every religious and ethnic background. They got on code and he became wacko Jacko and 
they started plotting our brother's demise. So they all get on code. I do not break them up. I don't break them up at all. That gives them too much of an alley-oop so they can start pointing the finger and playing hot potato and deflecting all over the place when all of them are on code with each other. Don't ever forget that. We better understand white supremacy is a team sport. It's a team sport. Y'all go check out. Well, I, I, I checked. I got the book, but I, I have to see the movie. And the movie is based on the book Killers of the Flower Moon. And I'm going to watch the movie just to see how accurate it is when it comes to the book. But the story is there were these Osage Indian women in Oklahoma. And they came into some money because of oil, from what I understand. So this family of women, they were just balling out. They got a lot of money. So you had these white supremacist men who started marrying into their families and slowly started to sabotage and kill the women so they can get the money. And everybody in town was in on it. All the white supremacists in town, the white police were in on it. The white doctors were in on it. The white judicial system, they were all, everybody knew what was going on and they were all working together to finesse these non-white people out of their money, you see. So we got to understand how they all get together to get on code with each other against um, non-white folks. Yeah. But again, yeah, the white industry itself, you know, the, the Sukihanas and the Sexy Reds, yeah. You know, they that's what they want to promote. You know, if you want to maintain, listen, listen, let's, let's, let's keep it a buck. Let's keep it a buck. We got to understand we're in a war. This is what black folks got to understand. This is a war we're in. And the white supremacists, they understand practicing warfare with a smile. They can act like they're helping you when they're actually planning warfare against you. So when they promote the Sukihanas and all of that stuff, they understand that's warfare, but they all work together with economic deprivation. You know, they'll deprive you of resources. And look, I'm telling you, these white supremacists sit in rooms together and they plot all this stuff. They plot it out. They're all buddies and they're sitting around and one buddy, and not only buddies, many of them are family. And one guy will be like, well, you know, I'm a prosecutor and I work at the, in the DA's office. So I work here and I, I work at marketing this and marketing that and and I work for policymakers and, you know, we, we deprive these black people neighborhoods of money so now the people are broken desperate and then his buddy will say well i'm a record exec and what i'm gonna do i'm gonna promote niggas blinged out and high on lean and we let everybody know if you get high on lean and just rap about it you can get some of this money so everybody's getting high and Everybody's being told the cool thing is to be high and whacked out of your mind. And But if you can slur a couple of good rhymes out, you know, we'll put you on. Now, if you're somebody trying to rap about something that makes sense, oh, no, no, you're not going to get signed. No, 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 no. No, we want you to rap about something ratchet. Now, we have a whole bunch of great rappers out here. We have phenomenal raps out here. We had a rap contest at the Hidden History Museum. We had a great time. People in there flowing. We got so much talent out here. But listen to the radio. You got people who can barely form sentences getting a million dollar budget. Did y'all see Kodak Black on the Drink Champs? This dude seemed whacked out of his mind. This dude seemed, he's, and I don't, I'm not saying he is, but the man looked like a full out drug addict. He looked like it. I'm not saying he is, but he looked like a straight crackhead. He looked what he you I couldn't understand half the stuff he was saying. His eyes were glossed over and bucking out. This is what labels like. And look, I live out here in Hollywood, dude. I'm telling you how they get down. When when black people walk in the room for any kind of deal, the first thing they try to do, they try to get you drunk, high, and throw some women on you. That's the first thing they do. I remember I would go to different industry functions and boy, the white execs would always try to give me liquor. 
They always got some new liquor that they want to get me to try. Hey, man, my, my buddy has this new vodka. I want you to try it. Come on, Tariq, try this. They love throwing liquor in your face. I noticed that early on. They all, And I don't drink at all. I'm not a drinker at all. I don't like drinking at all. You know, I like for my mind to be clear. Because, you know, when I was running the streets, I wanted to be very cognizant of everything that was going on. So I never got in the habit of drinking. I don't like drinking at all. So I don't like, I ain't drinking shit. No, no, no. I don't want to drink nothing. Don't want to smoke nothing. I don't smoke anything. They're always offering something to smoke or some pill to pop. I don't do none of that. Then they start throwing their broads on you. Nope. I'm cool. I already know her. They try to present chicks to me that I already know. That you, that's not shit. Nigga, that chick was over at the crib a few months ago. That's not nothing. So yeah, they 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 throw things at you heavy when you try to get into the industry so that you can get caught up, so that you can be distracted, so you're not really focused on money. So you're not focused on on power and and residuals, so you're not really focused on business. You know, they want you to be as whacked out as possible so that um they can get all your publishing and everything that you own. You dig when they when they sign listen, when they sign certain artists, they know who's going to become a problem. And when I say problem, somebody who's gonna want their money. You dig? You don't wanna do you really wanna hire a smart rapper? <laughs> if you're if you're running a record label, you need every dime possible. Are you really going to hire somebody intelligent or sign somebody intelligent, somebody who will say, hey, man, these contracts look kind of funny. I give Ice Cube that credit. You know, they don't want the, another Ice Cube, and I give Ice Cube credit. Ice Cube has said some things that have been kind of questionable, questionable lately, but I give Ice Cube business credit. He's a very good businessman. And Ice Cube early on saw the NWA contracts and was like, um, no, I'm not signing that because y'all already owe me money. When Jerry Heller came to them with them $75,000 checks, um, Cube was like, well, what, what happened to the money for the first album? I've already written a platinum album and I never got paid for that. So let's get that clear first because, yeah, this... This $75,000 check, y'all owe me that. And then, you know, Jerry Heller, they wanted to play the game on him. And Cube walked away. Smartest thing he did. They don't want that. They don't want another Ice-T. Ice-T is my brother. That's my guy. And Ice-T met Jerry Heller. Ice-T saw Jerry Heller and said, I don't trust him. I ain't fucking with him. Early on, Ice-T is like, I'm not messing with Jerry Heller. You know? So they don't want intelligent rappers going into these record labels, getting in these these deals and making sure that the business is straight. Yeah, they don't want that. So they want to get dudes. If you get somebody who's, who's high on Percocets all day and with a cup full of lean, that's the guy you want to get. You're going to make mumble rap the hot rap now. You're going to promote that. If you promote some hard enough, it will catch on. If you promote a, a, a dog farting over a beat, eventually it'll catch on in the mainstream, you know. It's all about what they're going to put money into. So if you get a female rapper who's intelligent and who's somewhat of a positive influence on young black girls like a Beyonce. Let me tell you something. They don't want too many Beyonce's. They don't want that. You know, Beyonce is a phenomenon and a very inspirational. But too many Beyonce's, that, that's a problem. Because that's power. Beyonce has become an industry within herself and a big influence and she can call shots. They don't want too many of those, you know, because that, that influences the next Beyonce and the next Beyonce. That influences thousands and not thousands, but millions of black girls to do things in a more constructive and a positive way, to get a family and have, you know, 
have a husband and you know things like that. But what they will sign is the bunch of Sukihanas and a bunch of sexy reds. Now they like that because they can make the record hot and they can promote ratchetness and that's not going to be empowering. You know, the, they know that a Sukihana and a sexy red, that they're not going to teach women about really building anything and handling business. They know that they're train wrecks. Yeah. So behind the scenes, the white supremacists are doing the bird man hand rub, especially when some of that ratchet stuff catches on. And then they said, oh, cool, this is the new wave. Let's sign a bunch of ratchet rappers. So you're about to see a bunch of them pop off. So yeah, they, they'll put the money behind the Lizzo's and the Sexy Reds and all of the Ratchets because that maintains their system. Yeah. Let's get um Boss Up. Let's get Boss Up. Boss Up, hop on. Rick. What's up, boss? Up? Hey, nothing much, man. Long time fan. Um, I'm out here in Chicago, and uh, I want to touch on that real quick, man. Uh, them Palestinians, they were pissed off because the uh, Israelite brothers were out there saying that we're not going to help y'all. You know what I'm saying? Y'all are not our allies, so don't ask us to come, you know what I'm saying, stand on that and get in the middle of that situation with them. And I'm not a Hebrew Israelite or anything like that, but... um. Yeah. They, them, uh, those Palestinians, they started like throwing shit. You know, they had like a deep crowd, so they'd, you know, be behind or like in the middle, and they start like flinging stuff over the top, and you know, then it, it kind of started getting spicy because of that. So they kind of initiated that thing because they felt like they had more numbers because they didn't came from all over the place to try to show, uh, you know, a uh, show of force out here, man. They've been real deep all through the weekend. I stay down here, man. It's been, you know, uh, they had to shut the bridge down and everything. So, uh, yeah, that was that was them, man. I want to say that. And uh, one more thing about Kodak Black. I was uh, I was uh, joking with Kanye earlier on her uh, tweet, and I was saying I kind of understood Kodak Black during that interview because I've been around, like, geekers and crackheads before, so I kind of know how to filter the nonsense <laughs> when they uh Ooh. when they're babbling you know but that that was a mess man but that's all i want to say man um you know keep doing your thing man i'll land my play appreciate you brother all right take but, care yeah yeah that kodak black and again with kodak black if anybody allegedly has a has an issue with you know narcotics i'm, I'm not trying to make light of it because it's sad to me i think it's very sad and it's a young dude sitting up there whacked out of his mind like that. And, you know, just that's that's a horrible look. And I'm not saying he is uh, allegedly. You know, I'm just saying what it looks like. It looks like the guy with Kodak Black was just whacked out of his mind. And for that to, you know, to promote that. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't I don't like if somebody appears to have some kind of drug issue, I don't like this whole thing where people put them on platforms. What's that kid, Orlando Brown, the guy who used to be on Disney? I absolutely hate when people put him on platforms. I hate it, hate it, hate it. I hate it. And then they start doing headlines about little weird shit he says. What he says is just, he's saying anything. He's literally saying anything. And I, and I think it's so exploitive to put him on platforms and get little sound bites. He said, hey, uh, Orlando Brown, Orlando Brown said that he um, had sex with a goat. He said that Jay-Z is the Illuminati. I, come on, man. He just sees. Come on, man. That, that I, I think that's an unscrupulous thing to have dude on there because not you're just doing shit for clicks. All right. Some people will put this cat on knowing that he's out of his mind. He's going to say anything. He's just going to make up shit and say. And then these the struggle bloggers are just doing the Birdman hand rub. Like, oh, shit, ooh, this is going to be a good headline. Yeah. Yeah, okay, you, know, you got to do all that shit for clickbait. I I just don't. That's, um, that's yellow journalism, man. That's, that's thirsty podcasting you dig i don't think that you gotta just 
you, you kill the integrity of your little platforms, but some people are just desperate for a click. You got a lot of people, you know, who do any click is honorable. They don't just, just all give me some eyes. Somebody watch me just for a quick minute. It's that mindset. And I ain't with that. I don't, I don't like to exploit anybody's issues or I don't, I damn sure don't like to exploit beefs with folks. That's one thing I don't like either. Cause you know, that whole Vlad thing. See, that's why a lot of people, Vlad tries to act innocent and people are on his bumper because Vlad and those guys, they know how to, they sit there and instigate little shit on their platforms and then act like they're innocent and neutral. They instigate shit and people know what it is. They sit there instigating things. They'll interview one person and then go find their enemy deliberately. Somebody who's, who has an issue with it and then bring them on the platform and then, and, and throw fuel on the fire. And then what happens is they do that shit on these little Vlad platforms. And then that shit spills over in the streets and then niggas start getting clapped up and then Vlad, Oh God, what, what happened? Oh God, the violence. We got to start the violence. Oh, ah, ah. After you just sat here instigating the shit, you think that's not cool. That's why I, when I had an issue, we ain't going to let it fall off in the streets. I went up there to Vlad's spot. Vlad tried that shit with me. No, we're not going to let this shit spill over in those streets. We're going to settle it right here on your platform, nigga. Let's handle it right here. You in the mix, too. Oh, and it's messed up, man. Oh, oh. So then after I went up there, Vlad had to get security. He has security up there now. You know, Vlad is still salty because of that. He's still salty because of that. But hey, yeah, if if we're going to get some straightening, you're going to be in the room when the straightening is going, bro. You're not going to sit up here and just throw something and then hide your fucking hand. No. Y'all got to let these vloggers know. If y'all instigate this shit, you in it too. And then you do it like that. Maybe they'll get some Mac right. But this is why, you know, with all of these different platforms and all of this stuff that's going on, we got to have our own media family. It's very important that we have our platforms and we support our platforms that gives a straightening counter narrative because people wait on us to bring the truth and a lot of times we get late let's keep it a buck black folks we do get lazy as far as getting information and getting together and getting on code and saying hey we're going to present the information on our terms we got this thing where we let white mommy and white daddy do all the heavy lifting We've gotten comfortable with just kind of riding in the background and we'll let white mommy and them, they'll handle all the hard work. And that's a problem because if we hand over the reins to them, they're going to create the narratives they want to create. You think? They're going to create all of the narratives that they want to create. And those narratives are going to be negative. And we can't keep complaining about their negative narratives. We can't keep complaining about the the sukis and the sexy reds and the the drug addict rappers and all of this shit if we're not getting on code and presenting a counter narrative you did because they got an endless supply of resources to put out negative propaganda and they use hip hop to do it they use our culture to do it and now when anything positive is about to pop off with our culture, all of a sudden it ain't our culture no more. See, when they want to show something negative, they don't never claim it. When they show the Suki Hanas and the Sexy Reds doing dirtbag degenerate shit, that it all becomes the black community. You notice that? Whenever they do these think pieces on Suki Hana and whenever they do something real weird, all of a sudden, we get all of these think pieces. Well, the black, what about the black community? The baby, the rapper, the baby said something about AIDS and homophobia. What about homophobia in the black community? Because of what the baby said. 
such and such rapper got shot, King Vaughn got shot. What about the violence in the black community? Anytime a rapper does something or something negative happens, it's the black community. Okay. Now, when rap or hip hop and break dancing goes to the Olympics, well, hip hop is everybody's culture. It's American culture. Look at hip hop. All hip hop lives matter. When it's positive, now hip hop, well, it was blacks and Latinos and Asians. And you know what? Some Eskimos was a part of hip hop too, because when they got in the igloos, they had to spin on their backs. Yeah. So now everybody, if it's positive, everybody has to get a piece of the positivity. Damn that. That's why microphone check is very important, family. Microphone check is very important. And you know, we still got four days to go. We are a little under our, our goal. Man, we should have been at our goal already. And I understand there's a, a very small group of real thoroughly conscious people. And, you know, we have to increase that. But, yeah, we should have been at our goal. And we're getting there. We got four days to get to our goal. Because, yeah, this is extremely important. Let's get um, Belogi. Belogi, hop on, sir. Hey, my man. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Now, where are you from, bro? I'm, uh, I'm from Canada. From Canada, Montreal. Okay. And are yeah. you Palestinian? I saw a Palestinian flag on your thing. Yeah, I am. I am Palestinian. So okay. uh, half Palestinian, half Lebanese. Born in Lebanon. Came to uh, Canada 12 years ago. And yeah, so far, uh, so good, uh, you know. Cool. All right, so what's on your mind, bro? So yeah, I heard you were talking about like rappers and... and and violence and stuff like that like i just want to say uh, regarding this topic like because a lot of a lot of the new generation is being uh, are being influenced by uh, by the rappers and the, and the music industry to, uh, today and you know like if you actually look back at the uh, at the music uh, in the past whether it's rap or r&b like the vocabulary alone was clean like it was it, it was more like romantic it was more like metaphorical it was more uh it was more kind of interesting to me in the past right but yeah now you move on to now you move on to today and it's not it's not necessarily like metaphorical anymore like the uh, the, the rappers the artists are just like shooting the words straight straight away like the the lyrics the lyrics nowadays like have zero uh zero vocabulary in my point of view and i think like that affects how the manners and the respect and uh, all of these things like towards the new generation and towards how they interact with each other and i find like it's not necessarily 100 like positive um it's because it also affects like their communication skills it affects their uh, their day-to-day -day life it, it would possibly also influence them in a bad way you know what i mean So it's uh, it's very interesting to me. Yeah, I just wanted to 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 talk about this topic, and uh, right. uh, yeah, like maybe we can influence some some good thing. Right. Let me let me touch on that. But thank you so much, Bill. I appreciate you. Let me touch on that. Well, you know what, man? Here's the here's the thing. Um, a lot of times, people blame rap for a lot of things that it's not responsible for. Now, are there some influences? Yeah, of course. Of course, there's some influences. Uh, but rap is often used as a scapegoat. Rap is often used as a scapegoat. Let, let me be clear. Um, a lot of shit that goes on in the streets ain't got nothing to do with no rap records, man. Look, a lot of shit that happens in the streets is street business. Dude... I've been in the streets for real, for real, around real hitters. Let me tell you something. Back in the day, some of these hitters I used to roll with, man, and I was like one of the, the only ones around my crew that didn't get high. My niggas used to get high all the time and do all types of rah-rah shit. A lot of times before them niggas got ready to do some rah-rah shit, they would sit in the crib and they would listen to classical music. 
It was the funniest thing. The niggas would get high. They'd be all in the room chilling. It was a radio station. I forgot the name of the station out here in L.A. Back in the late 80s. I forgot the name of the station. Um, K.A.'s. I forgot it was something. But it would play classical music. And them niggas would be sitting up here getting high listening to Beethoven. And then hit the streets and do all types of rah-rah shit. When niggas ready to do rah-rah shit, they'll listen to anything, dude. It ain't the music. It's the circumstances. It doesn't matter what record is on. If a nigga, if you in the streets get money and a nigga owe you money, nigga, a motherfucker roll up on your ass playing Chaka Khan and light you the fuck up. It ain't the music, dude. Yeah, can the music kind of ins- get people turned up a little bit? Yeah, it can. Can music mellow some people out? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's music that can and have an impact on your mood and your vibe. But to say that it's the cause of um, violence and, and stuff like that, eh. And here's the thing. As we know, 80% of the, the people who buy rap records, who buy the, the, the music, they're white. You understand? People always leave that out. Most people who buy rap records are actually white people. That's why when you go to these big concerts, mostly white people there. You go to the Rolling Louds and the Coachellas and all of these music. It's mostly white people at these concerts, and they know all the words to the rap songs. Yeah, They're the biggest audience for it. Don't ever forget that. 